Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Um, I, I wanna encourage you that if you're here today and uh, you have family or you yourself are uh, wrestling with the, the subject or the lifestyle of homosexuality, I wanna encourage you just to hear me out today, to hear God out today. Uh, we just saying, we'll open up our heart. Would you open up your heart to what God has to say to you today? And I just want to encourage you to, to stick around, all right, and to hear God's heart in this message. Uh, the, the Christian church, we're going to hold on to biblical truth, but we're also going to, haunt, we're going to hold on to grace when we tell the truth. And church, we need to do that. Church, we need to hold on to the biblical truth of God's word on a variety of subjects. But we also need to hold on to the grace and make sure we are delivering it with grace and love. And when it comes to those who are in the LGBTQ plus community, we love them and want to reach them because they are no different than us that we are sinners and Christ died for all of us. And we all have things that we deal with. And so it's important that everyone knows we're on the same, the, as my mom always says, the, the, the ground at the cross is level. <laughs> we all stand there equal. I want us to understand as I go into week two on this subject that we have to remember that rejecting God and choosing sin has systemically impacted all of humanity. We all have fallen short of God's glorious standard. We all are sinners. And we reach those who do not know Christ with love for the truth and love for them. So we love the truth and we love people. And we help the lost by being patient, building relationships and helping them understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want to show us today uh, what happens when humanity rejects God as creator. And I need to confront some beliefs and ideas that are false and that Satan is using to deceive Christians and, and especially non-Christians of the LGBTQ plus community. But also we see that in church nowadays that churches either are afraid to talk about this subject or are are beginning to affirm and, and say that this, this subject is not a sin, that this lifestyle is not a sin. And it's, that's not biblical, so that's lying to people. And I believe that if you love someone, you don't lie to them. Now, you also don't beat them in the head with a hammer either to get a point across, right? And uh, this fence is gonna represent, just really it's been represented in our whole series about holding on to truth and there's there are boundaries and lines that we're not supposed to cross into uh, sin, okay? And I want us to understand something real quick too. I'm not saying that we can't go outside the fence and reach people, we should. That's what Jesus did. When he ate with sinners, he would go outside the boundaries of things and go eat with people. I'm talking about morals. This is like a moral line, okay? And the, what the world has been wanting to do is if, if this is the safety of, of being, you know, a believer of God and the word of God, the, the world has been wanting us to move it out so that more sin can fit in and that it's okay to live these ways. And we're talking about a variety of things, not just homosexuality. And so if we can make, if we can move the line, you know, maybe, maybe uh, everyone feels safe inside now, but God would say, no, you're still in sin. And so the line, the, the boundary must stay right here. Okay, so people want us to move them. And the church in certain denominations is moving that boundary and that fence. Um, <clears throat> and they're, they're compromising on the word of God rather than compassionately telling the truth to people who need to hear the truth. And so here at Calvary, we, we love everyone enough to even speak the truth in love. And so that's the subject today is the truth in love on homosexuality. And there are some lies that I want to address because um, here's how I look at it. I don't hate anyone. I, I can't stand sin in my life and I don't stand sin in people's lives because it destroys lives. And God hates sin too. 
And so I also know that the devil is at work as well, deceiving people. So sin is very deceiving, Scripture says. The devil is very deceiving. All right, so I am upset with that. I'm not upset with people. I'm not going to attack people. I'm going to love people and then speak the truth about sin and what the devil's doing. And so today, please hear me that my, my approach is that I want to tell the truth about sin and expose some lies from the, from the enemy. Amen? That's, that's where we're headed. We're going to be in Romans 1, 18 through 32. Again. <clears throat> and by the way, these, these, these things I'm addressing today, I, can, I, get, I encounter them all the time in our high schools, with college students, uh, with everyone. And tomorrow, I'll be in a school talking about Christianity in two periods, two class periods in a world religions class, and I will probably face this thinking tomorrow as well. And here's our scripture. Again, this is Paul showing how bad humanity has gotten, and he wants us to understand how far, we, how far we've gotten off from rejecting God, and therefore he brings the gospel up next and how we need Jesus to save us, and that is in the following chapters. So, Verse 18, Romans 1.18, but God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly, clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie, so they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulge in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men as a result of this sin. They suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. And he ends with this, they know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. Wow. That was the condition of humanity. And by the way, if you didn't listen to last week's message, please do for context on this entire um, subject, because I broke that down more. Today, I'm going to break down something different from the scripture. But this is the condition of humanity because humanity rejected God and God was abandoning them at this time, but he didn't completely abandon them, did he? We learned last week that Jesus came while we were still sinners. Christ died for us to save these people, which includes us. That's the gospel. That's how bad we were and things are returning to that, aren't they? And have have exponentially increased in that direction again. Uh, Paul doesn't pick on one sin. He talks about all of them in this scripture that we just read. And so all, without Jesus Christ, humanity is doomed without the salvation and grace of Jesus Christ saving us. So this goes and applies to everyone. What I want us to see, though, is there's an incredible downward progression starting with identity beliefs, and then lifestyle. Because when we reject God, we reject our true identity. So number one, let me discuss that real quick. Rejecting God as our creator and designer 
cause confusion and issues with knowing our true identity. We abandoned who we are according to our Creator for who we want to be according to ourselves. So God was defining who we are supposed to be, but when you reject God, you're left to now define who you want to be. Rejecting God is to have no identity, therefore you come up with your own source of identity, and this has led to people, uh, uh, people to look to sexuality and human relationships as the foundation for who they are, what they believe, and how they live. Let, let me tell you what I'm doing here. I'm showing you what has taken place, not just in the homosexual community, but any, any community, any kind of lifestyle that's against God. When you deny what God, who God is and what he has made you for and designed you for, you have to create your own because you don't have his. By the way, he's your creator, so he should say who you are. I'm gonna get into that in a little bit more. What's the next part? If we don't know who we are, we gotta make up who we are, and then we gotta make up our own beliefs or standards for living because we don't take God's knowledge and standards for living. We don't take his beliefs for us. We have to make our own. So number two is beliefs. Rejecting God's will and knowledge for us calls us to create our own beliefs. And that's what they did. They believed that they could do these sins. They believed that they could participate in these ways. They believed that they were okay. We traded the knowledge for God for a lie, and this left us to create our own humanistic beliefs and convictions. And you've probably heard this before. This is where we get the idea in postmodern thinking that you can create your own truth and live your truth, I'll live my truth. That's postmodern thinking that has denied what God thinks and what God wants, and so therefore we make up whatever we think is true. That is moral relativism as well, mixed with postmodern thinking. We do whatever we want, and you can do whatever you want. And so lastly, oh, by the way, when it comes to beliefs in the homosexual community, this is where some of the things I'm going to address today. <clears throat> um, we've come up with beliefs that I was born this way. You can be gay and Christian at the same time. The Bible should change with the times. Love is love. If you love me unconditionally, you'll approve my choice. It's a little quiet and tense in here. Is that because we've heard these things? <laughs> Again, I say this out of love. When we don't have an identity, we create our own. When we don't know what to believe anymore, we create our own beliefs. The problem is it's humans creating these things. Who gets the final say of what is true and what is right? If we're all in the same equal playing field, it's got to be the one who provided all that, which is God. But we've abandoned that in humanity. So what we, this, is, this is what I'm concerned of. My friends, my neighbors, anyone maybe in this church today who's, uh, who's in this lifestyle, we have followed our own instead of God's. And so my heart breaks and my heart is concerned because I've seen what humanity comes up with. It's not that great when it comes to beliefs and identity and such. It's confusing. And lastly, there's lifestyle. The third point is lifestyle. Rejecting God's ways calls us to create our own ways to live, which do not honor and obey God. So the identity and beliefs of our own liking, our own worldview, leads us to fashion our own lives around this identity and belief system. Uh, you, you've probably heard this said, and I've, I deal with uh, apologetics and, and ministering to people outside the fence, okay? I like to come out here and help people. And when I come out here, I hear people say, um, you Christians, you just follow a set of beliefs made up by man. Now, let me tell you what we really do uh, in a minute, but let me tell, tell you what I say. And I go, well, where do your beliefs come from? And those beliefs are from man. And then you create so you create a life around those beliefs, don't you? Because we get accused of creating a life just, you know, Christians have to live this way and mankind made that up. And so that's just a way to oppress and to make people feel terrible about their lives. And I've heard these things. I'm, I'm not kidding you. And I'm like, but don't you follow your own set of identity, belief, and ways of living? And isn't it not from mankind who created these things? Yeah, I guess you're right. 
The difference with Christians is we believe God has given us these things. That's the difference, is we believe God has given us our identity and then given us the beliefs by which we live by, the standards, the doctrines that we follow and obey. Man didn't make this up. God did. And God's our creator. And so I lovingly explained that to them and helped them understand that. Um, so rejecting God has created a lot of ideas and beliefs, and I would like to lovingly correct the following three. Number one, the saying, your identity is defined by sexuality. Number two, people are born gay. And number three, you can be a gay Christian. Um, Ryan, why are you doing this right now? This is a little too tense. Um, here's why. Because people have believed these things, they're not going to believe what God says. And we have to speak the truth into these situations. And if people believe these things, they will be stuck in this way of life that is God has condemned us in. And you can apply this to anything else, all right? Can we also relax? Let's take a deep breath. Okay. Um, here's what we need to do. We have to understand that anytime we confront sin, it can always be tense of any kind. It's not easy to be a Christian. It's not easy to follow God's word. His standards are higher than ours. We just have to get used to this, church. It's because we love people enough to tell them the truth. And so number one, you're, I, want to, I want to let you know, and I want to teach us as a church, we need to be equipped on this, is your identity is not defined by sexuality. Your identity is not defined by how much money you have. Your identity is not defined by what you did in the past, what you're going to do today. None of that. Your identity is defined by God. Let me explain. Let me use scripture. Genesis 1, 26 through 27. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, and all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. There we actually have our understanding of where we have gender and that there's two genders, male and female, okay? But what I want to talk about is that we bear the image of God and we're supposed to reflect God's design for mankind and for love and for relationships. And God says right there that we're created in his image and he goes on to talk about marriage between a man and a woman and we are to bear that image. If we're going to be married, we're to bear that image. If we're not married and we stay single or something like that, whatever journey you go on, what we do is we bear the image and character of God. God's faithfulness, God's love, God's patience, God's truth. You bear and reflect those things. That's what it means to be an image bearer of God. We are to look like Jesus. And Jesus never condones sin. He never approves it. So we wouldn't want to look like sin either. So this convicts us all on all things, doesn't it? Unfortunately, sin hindered this image bearing. But Jesus came to restore what sin and the devil have tried to destroy. That's why Jesus came. Praise the Lord. Salvation in Christ has made it possible for us to bear his image again. The garden hindered that and messed it all up. But now Jesus restores us back to the garden, so to say, spiritually. And he's going to bring us back to the new heavens and new earth in the end. Jesus transforms us into sons and daughters of God. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us, empowers us, helps us to deny sinful desires so we can pursue what reflects God's character and purpose in creation. Jesus does all that for you so that you can now be like Jesus and bear the image of God. You're not God, trust me, and neither am I. Let's make sure we get that straight. But we're in his likeness. We can help point people to God and how we live in relationship and love others, etc. cetera. Okay, uh, Christopher Ewan, he was a man who lived in this lifestyle of homosexuality, came to know Christ in prison, <laughs> And a powerful story. Look him up. Uh, he says this. Society says God loves me just the way I am when looking to accept their sexuality. My identity should not be grounded in my sexuality, 
My identity is not gay or ex-gay or even heterosexual for that matter. My identity is in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus was there creating us as well. Amen. You could say that because of the garden, we all lost our true identity. And now Jesus is trying to restore our true identity. But Jesus doesn't say it's based on your sexuality. It's based on him. Because he created you. He created you for a purpose. He created you to look and be like him in the way you live. Number two... Uh, people are not born gay. Uh, there's, there, is a, there is a argument out there that people are born gay, and they'll say this, why would God prohibit me from living how he created me? Why would he stop me if he created me to be like this? Um, well, first of all, one thing I do help people understand is that there is no such thing as a straight gene or gay gene. And researchers have not found that. There was a study done on it, whether there was one or not. And what happened was journalists took that and ran with it and said they have been finding a gay gene. And that's not true. And they didn't report the next part that they didn't find one. That our genetics don't define whether you're straight or gay. And so that's just to be understood um, moving forward. You're not born gay, but there is an explanation for why you may be struggling with same-sex desires. And I bring this up just in case anyone is. There may be a reason. Here's why. We are born into a sinful and fallen world. We are born sinners and have the propensity or inclination for sinful desires due to our sinful nature that can lead us to act on those sins. But we are not designed by God and born to live a particular sinful lifestyle. When God made us, he said it was very good. It wasn't sinful. It was very good. And then because we sinned, now we've been, we've been hindered. We've been hurt. We've been fallen. We have a sinful nature. And so there is a chance that as a young person, as a young kid maybe, that you have felt those sinful desires of same-sex attraction. That would explain it. We all sometimes have desires for sinful things, even at a young age. But it doesn't mean you were born that way at all. Um, here's, I want to make sure I read this word for word, because here's what I see happening. Our sinful nature that has the inclination and the desire to sin, which is in all of us that we wrestle with, with no help before Jesus, but now with Jesus, we have the help, Holy Spirit to help us. Our sinful nature or sinful nurture can cause people to have same-sex attraction as well. The world we live in, tell me if this isn't true. The world we live in affirms and celebrates same-sex attraction and relationships which lure, appeal, and reinforce our sinful desires. God never encourages us to fulfill sinful desires in Scripture. He says to deny them, to resist temptation. So what we're dealing with is we all have this propensity and inclination to sin even at a young age. And if we live in a society in a world that applauds sinful lifestyles, our sinful nature will be like, oh, I guess it's okay. And that's why we need Jesus to save us so that we don't give in to our sinful nature. Instead, we follow what God wants, what, what the Holy Spirit wants. And that goes for all of us, no matter what you deal with with sin. Now, here's the thing. If it were true... Let's say, hypothetically speaking, that someone could be born gay. Then Jesus would say the solution is to be born again. If someone was born a sinner, like all of us, guess what we have to experience? Rebirth, spiritually, to be born again. If someone were born and let's say you could be born a certain way uh, and you, you're born a murderer, a liar, a cheater, an adulterer, then guess what I would tell you? Same thing I would tell someone that, is, that, is, that says they were born gay. I would say to that person, I would say, then you must be born again. What does that mean? Let's look at what scripture says in John 3 through 6. 
Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus, how can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. He's referring to the Holy Spirit in both terms. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. And when God changes you on the inside spiritually, he changes your heart and desires for everything else in life. That's why last week I said, if you're saying, I can't change, it's true. You can't change on your own power. You can't change based off your human abilities. You need the Holy Spirit to change you on the inside so that he can give you those desires. Next week, we're going to hear a testimony of someone who's been changed from the inside out. And because of that, it has changed her lifestyle. And we're looking forward to it. By the way, just so you know, she's going to be on stage, both services with me. We're going to sit down together and talk about her story. And then at 1 o'clock, we're going to open up the sanctuary for a Q&A with her mom as well to learn how did mom and daughter work this all out? How did, how did they love each other? How did mom love her daughter even while pursuing a homosexual lifestyle? So come back next week and stay for the one o'clock uh, Q&A time, open forum. It's going to be really powerful. I think we're going to have coffee and snacks just to help hold you over to lunch. Sorry, Eagles fans. I know the game's at one o'clock. You know I looked it up, so this is more important. <clears throat> so, <laughs> I think I heard some Eagle fans go, <laughs> so I, know, so. I know they care. Um, when we are saved or born again, this is what happens. God transforms us into a new creation, giving us the Holy Spirit to have new desires and power to do what pleases him. That's 2 Corinthians 5.17. That's Philippians 2.13. Being born again restores you to your true identity, a new creation, a child of God. It's Jesus bringing you back to where you're supposed to be. We're not perfect, but he works on us until the day we die or he comes back. We are taught by God not to give in to our sinful desires or they give birth to sin and death. That's James 1, 13 through 14. We are taught to no longer conform to the pattern of this world, the influence of nurture around us, the sinful nurturing that says do these things. We're told no longer conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Romans 12, 1 through 2. How do we do that? By obeying the word of God. John 17, 17. Let the word of God sanctify us. His word is truth. So God had a plan when he was saving us. He had a plan to change your heart and mind towards sin and to help you do what pleases God. He had a plan. But you can't change your lifestyle or your ways without Christ coming into your life first. That's why we preach the gospel and and encourage people to be saved so that you can overcome this world and sin. And lastly, uh, gay Christianity is unbiblical. We can't be gay and Christian. Now, take this from Rosario Butterfield. She also was someone who lived in this lifestyle. She walked away from it because she found Christ. Do you know how she found Christ? A church opened up their home once a week or every week for Bible study and dinner. They invited her to come knowing that she was a practicing homosexual. They invited her to come and they loved on her and ate with her. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? Well, eventually she starts singing the songs that they're singing, reading the Bible, praying. They did not indoctrinate her. They did not brainwash her. She said God began to work in her heart. And she gave her life to Jesus Christ. And she was a doctor, a professor. And now she travels the nation and the world speaking on this subject. And she's very bold, by the way. You can look her up, Rosario Butterfield. She's on YouTube. Her story is out there. She goes, and she tells you the truth. And let me give you an example of what she says. She says, gay Christianity, whether a person is sexually active or not, is a different religion from biblical Christianity. Gay Christianity adds things to the gospel. And then she says this, the idea that gay is who you are comes from Satan. Gay is not who you are, even though you believe it represents how you feel. If you believe that gay is who you are, It is impossible 
to war against your homosexuality as a sin because this sin has morphed into other areas. In other words, you can't separate the two now. If you believe you're a certain way and Christian, now you can't address that sin because it's become who you are. So that, that's, you know what that is? That's the, the sin that easily entangles. And now you can't separate a sinful lifestyle from a Christian lifestyle. That's what people want us to do as Christians is say it's okay to be gay and Christian. And the word of God never says that. The Bible never does. Here is someone who lived a lifestyle for years and is saying that is not true. That's a lie from Satan. And she's saying this honestly because she loves people. This belief seeks to marry the world with God, and they are two different kingdoms. She says this, there is no dual citizenship in Christ. A Christian cannot have one foot in the world and one foot in Christ. <clears throat> it's hard life too, isn't it? To be faithful to God, but it's, it's safe. And it's what God wants. So how do we, how do we love people? How do we love? How do we love people that, are, that have been struggling with um, same-sex attractions? How do we love people who believe some of the lies that Satan has created ever since we've rejected God? He's been busy creating beliefs and humanistic philosophies that people have fallen for. By the way, we read, we read scripture a few weeks ago that there is teachings taught by demons. I'm not calling anyone a demon. I'm just saying teachings taught by demons. Okay, and the devil's behind a lot of this false stuff, or all of it, right? He's the author of falsehood and lies. How do we love? Well, I've been already loving right now by being real and honest, by saying that none of those beliefs are biblical. And I've been correcting them because I love people. And I want parents and families to know that too, so that you're not careful to condone these beliefs that are actually unbiblical completely. So how do we love? Friends, parents, church, what should we do? And I'm going to talk a lot to parents, but let's try to apply this in every way we possibly can. Uh, we show compassion and care all the time without condoning or celebrating sin. You can love someone without applauding what they're doing that's evil or wrong or sinful. You can love them. You can be there. In fact, 1 Corinthians 13 is my guide, 4 through 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. And then it goes on to verse 6. It does not rejoice about injustice or sin or evil, Love, are, but it rejoices whenever the truth wins out. So it doesn't rejoice with evil things. It rejoices with the truth. And we've been, this whole series is called Holding On to Truth, right? So we rejoice with truth. Verse 7, love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Parents, you better stick by your kid, but you cannot say you're okay with their lifestyle. But you can always be there for them and love them. But anything that calls you to now be in agreement with them, that sends the wrong signal about the Word of God. So you can love. One, one writer who used to live in this lifestyle said, uh, we can be compassionate without compromise. And we have to learn that. We have to learn when it's too far and I can't say okay to that. Or I, can't, I can't say that I'm okay with that. So secondly, do you know how you love people? This one's, this one's not very popular. We disagree. Wait, what, Ryan? Pastor Ryan, are you, are you kidding me? You want me to disagree with my kid who's already upset with me? You didn't invent this boundary. God did. This boundary was already there. I'm only telling you what the Bible says. I'm not creating this. People's offense is with God, not me, not you, parents. If they're offended by what God's word says, they have to take it up with God, not you. I can't move my boundary because I, I, that's not mine. That's God's. And I love my kid too much that I will not lie to him so he feels okay or she feels okay, and only to find out in the end she's not okay, he's not okay. One of the most loving things that you can do with anyone, not even just on this subject, is when they're wrong, you can disagree. Gently disagree. 
I know that's not popular. Uh, by the way, since when did our kids become more right than God? One moment, they, they agree with God's word. Next moment, they disagree with God's word, and all of a sudden, your child is right. I'm pretty sure God is much wiser and smarter than anyone here on earth, including you. I, I say that in love, but it just kind of cracks me up because I've dealt with this with parents. It's just like that. What about unconditional love? You have to unconditionally love me. That's more like saying nowadays you have to unconditionally accept everything that I want to do. That's really what people are saying. Uh, Christopher Ewan says this, the same one I was talking about earlier. Unconditional love is not the same as unconditional approval of my behavior. I'm always going to love my kids no matter what, but I'm not going to approve their behavior. I'm always going to be here if they need me, but I will not approve of things that are not of God. If my son was a thief, okay, and he's not, but if my son was a thief, everyone's like going to start dodging him in church when they see him. If he kept stealing from stores and restaurants and things, do I go, hey, I have to unconditionally love him? No. I would need to correct him. I would need to tell him that is wrong. I would need to disagree with that lifestyle. Right? But for some reason, for this one, we don't. You see how the world has watered us down? Because they use love. Love. But God has not said, God, God says you can love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not rejoice with evil. It only rejoices with truth. That is love. See, the world's trying to redefine love to be something different so that every sinful thing we do can fit in. Let's move, let's move this out. You know, let's use love as the way to get people to feel bad. Let's make my parents feel bad for standing up for what is true by saying, well, that means you don't love me. Parents, are you hearing me today? I'm speaking some truth today. I'm trying to strengthen you today. Okay, I'm trying to strengthen you today. Hey, pick, pick whatever sin God prohibits. We need to stand our ground because it is a slippery slope and easily entangles people. So I don't care what sin it is. We need to be honest and disagree with our kid and show them the way. And by the way, if people are going to preach unconditional love, then they have to apply it too. That means that they have to unconditionally love you if you disagree. Pop, just pop that bubble. That false, see what I'm saying? That false teaching is tricky, isn't it? Because you, you will feel bad for not loving someone unconditionally, but now they shun you and call you a hater or a bigot because you didn't love them unconditionally. Well, wait a second. I thought we were going to love each other unconditionally. Now, thankfully, I've run into people that don't do that, that are in the homosexual lifestyle, and they go, hey, Ryan, I respect your beliefs, and, and I, I respect that you're making that stand. I won't, I won't disagree with you on that. I, they disagree, but they won't fight me on it. And I go, well, thank you for that. That means you unconditionally love me. I appreciate that. So it's, it's out there. Thank the Lord. Uh, thirdly, I'm almost done. And Dorothy's going to come out because Dorothy's got to share some good stuff here. Uh, thirdly, love is war, church. Anyone married? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. How many of you love your family? You're willing to go to war for them. We go to war by praying for people. We go to war by being patient and letting God work in ways that we cannot work. I got I to gotta pray for someone's life to change. I'm talking about every subject right now, every kid, every parent in this room, every grandparent that's dealing with something with their grandkids or kids. Listen, love is war. And it takes prayer. That's the best weapon. And then it takes trusting God to work in ways that you cannot do. Do not try to take that sword. Do not do that. You, you, you might mess up. You're going to say something you shouldn't have said. Do something you shouldn't have done. You got to trust God. He's going to fight for your kid. You're staying here because someone prayed for you. Or you're sitting here, technically. Love is patient. Play the long game. We love longer than anyone else 
while holding on to biblical truth. We love longer. That's what we do, church. I will be here for my kids no matter what, but they will never hear out of the word of my mouth. It's okay to do that. You'll be okay when it's a sin. I'll never do that. I thank God that no one did that to me. Lastly, there's a fence. Don't put this slide up yet. Just hold off on that slide. There's a fence. And this fence does represent a standard and boundary placed by God. And this standard helps us know what is sinful and what is righteous or holy. This fence has become offensive to many because of what it prohibits them. But again, God did it for our good. But we've been influenced as Christians to move the fence out so things that were once called sin can be welcomed and considered good. But we didn't write these standards or put this boundary in place. God did. God doesn't get it wrong. We do, church. Humanity got it wrong. Here's the good news. There is something that shows us whether we've gone too far or not. And there was research done on this where children were playing on a playground with no fence and they stayed around the playground because of the safety and the traffic around the playground driving by. But when they put a fence up, they all of a sudden ran to the barriers of the fence and began to enjoy the entire land, the entire, the entire part of the property, everywhere. They enjoyed, they played in the grass, but when they took away the boundary, they noticed that all the kids stayed near the playground because it wasn't safe. But when they, when they put the boundary up, when they put the fence up, they all went out and enjoyed the land. That's what God has done. God has, has actually given you a full life to live. And, and he's helped you see that, well, that's, that's going to destroy your life. But if you stay within this life, you get to enjoy life. And you're going to have the li life to the fullest with me. He did it for our good. The world's not going to see that. We have to understand that, church. We have to understand that. The world's not going to see it that way. When they have the mind of Christ, when they are reborn, then they'll get it. And that's why I try to help my friends see, right? But there's another thing about the gospel that's beautiful, okay? It's in John 10, that there's a gate. There's a gate. See, this isn't just a fence. There's a door to get into God's kingdom. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus is the gate. The world sees this. The world sees this. This is all they see. A barrier, a wall. You know, we, we, I guess, you know, apparently we hate them. We don't love them. That's not true. Jesus has made a way. And by the way, this is what Jesus would do, my friends. Jesus would walk out here and go to people. Jesus would go seek and save the lost. He wouldn't join in out here. He wouldn't participate in their sin. He would never pat them on the back for their sin, but he would come out here and he would reach people. And so do I. And church, we need to as well. We need to as well. We've seen the goodness of God inside here, right? And when you've seen the goodness of God inside of his life that he has for us, you want to go out here and bring people in. Now, Tomorrow at a school, I'll be doing that in two class periods. I'll be sharing about Christianity in a world religious class. And I'm going to love them enough. If they ask me a tough question, I'm going to tell them the truth. Why would I do that? Because the gospel will rattle in their minds and in their hearts, and the Holy Spirit will use that gospel to reach them. I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to offend them. That, that's on them if they get offended by the word of God. But I'm going to speak the truth in love. And I'm going to tell them about the amazing gate that lets everyone in if they would believe in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Dorothy's going to come out and close us in prayer. But if you need prayer today as a family member, as friends, maybe you yourself are wrestling with uh, this, this subject or others, we have our team ready to pray with you right down here in the front. So Dorothy, come on out, and you can close us in prayer too. Sound good? Let me, let me just do a quick prayer, a preliminary prayer before you share. How about that? God, we thank you for this word. God, I thank you, Lord, that even just from the messages I received last week and the, the, 
atmosphere in this room, God, that this church gets it, that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we all need to come to Christ. And, Lord, we can love people and, Lord, not, not agree with their, their sin or their lifestyle, but we can love people. God, give us discernment. Give us wisdom on how to do this, even things I didn't mention, God. And may we communicate it with gentleness and grace. Lord, save hearts today. Bring kids home. Lord, help parents, Lord, to be resolved in the word of God, to, to stand on the word of God and love their children. Help us as a church to show the love of Christ without compromise. We love you, God, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.